who introduced Carl Farmer, Jonathan Farmer, so who, who was a, a master's student at Royal College of Art in fashion and swear, um, and went on to work as a designer, cutter, stylist, uh, illustrator, has worked with the Anaconda Queen, and has been um, an educational <coughs> advisor, educational worker to the Metropolitan Museum of Art for their show on uh, Savage Beauty, for their work on, um, is it Balenciaga? Prada and Scaparelli. It was Prada and Luke Scaparelli, yeah, okay. And it's now about to um, launch the very first MFA in fashion design at FIT, a new cohort, in its own course. So, living the dream of being able to <laughs> make your own <laughs> art school, what would you like to do? I'd like to have my own art school. And he gets to instruct the architects on where to put the sockets and what to put <laughs> and what the art school should feel like. So, it, it, it's um, an extraordinary um, privilege. Is it coming here? Mm -hmm. You're going to be here soon? Oh, no. The FIT is in New York. Then we want you advise here. Oh, well, that would be nice. That would Could be you be nice. an advisor? Yes. Yeah, so. ASAP. Yeah. <laughs> Wait um, to see the presentation, then we'll remind us. So those, those of you might know Flora McLean, who's our accessories senior tutor research. Um, so Flora runs a whole department. So, uh, yesterday. So, uh, yep. And... Um, so, Carl, we're very interested in the idea of narratives, biography, life, life, creativity, work. Yeah. How does it work together? And what happens when it does work and it doesn't work? And That's the exactly what you're about use. to do. Yeah. Great. We'll yeah. all learn from the creative use of fingers. Hello, everyone. Hello. <laughs> so, the first thing we're going to do, guys, is turn the computer on. So, um, Hi, and thank you for having me here. I'm very excited to be back, actually. It's um, literally 17 years ago that I left um, here. And uh, the last time I was in this room, which I've told several people, was to hear Salman Rushdie speak. So it's a pretty extraordinary thing to be standing exactly where he stood, talking about the satanic verses. Um, so yeah, I'm quite uh, a little bit overwhelmed in uh, an emotional way to be back somewhere that I love very much, which is the Royal College. So I'm talking about rites of passage. Uh, which was a wonderful title that Eve gave uh, in terms of Research Live. And again, thank you, Eve, for making this happen. I'm very, very grateful. But I'm talking particularly about sort of my process of understanding myself, not just as a human being, but also as, an, as a, a writer, an academic, an artist, um, and dealing with things that happened in my life. <coughs> Sorry. It's just actually very hard to do, you know. It's like you, 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 you I sat and built this um, presentation, and um, I cried. You know, it was it was really very very hard to reflect on 41 years of oneself and build it into a 30 slide presentation. Um, but I'm talking about my own sort of uh, pedagogical boundaries and uh, how they sort of. Um, became things that I used as opposed to things that were hard. They were hard, but I, you know, the mistakes that I made, the, the processes I went through, and um, anyway, we're going to do a bit of karaoke to start with, guys, so I hope you're all ready to sing along with this song, but you might know or you might not, but this is a song by... <laughs> Shirley Bassey. So, it's a little long, but... If you don't want to sing, just read the words because they're quite poetic. When I was young. Ta -da. A little bit of drama there. You know what? I, I, it's, uh, it's an amazing song. So uh, there's two things you need to notice on this. At the bottom of the screen there, you're going to see pictures of me growing up. And then the, the main screen is there as a, as a narrative of my life, of my work, and so on and so forth. So, um, you know what? I, these are drawings I did when I was a little boy. Um, I've always been good at drawing. And I've always been really scared of writing. Terrified of it, actually. Um, and I was really bad at it. And um, I've ran from it all my life. And now I'm at the FIT, um, as Claire is saying, and I had to write a an MFA, an entire program, 21 courses, and I had 10 weeks to do it. And I was shit scared. 
I'm not going to lie to you. I was terrified. But I, it, it, it got to the point where I had to do something, and I couldn't run anymore. And that's what's really exciting about looking back at my life and seeing that even at the age of eight, I was drawing fashion, making clothes. Um, and something that's been, been with me for a very, very, very long time and became a crutch, actually, because I knew I had those visual literacies. Um, and I didn't know that I was dyslexic. And things happen in your life where they make you turn on, sort of turn around and have to see yourself in a different way. And I was really good at gymnastics when I was a kid. I was um, pretty good. But then I had two hip replacements. Um, my first one was when I was seven. And then again when I was 14. And I had to change my path. I was going to be a gymnast or a jockey and because uh, I'm little. Can you see me over here? Yeah. Um, so, you know, things happen in your life, and they make you have to look at yourself differently and look at, and, you know, look at what you want to do. And because I was so sick, I was off school for a very long time. And um, I was in a hospital bed. I had, you know, my legs were up in um, casters and stuff. And because I was really bad at writing, my mother, who is the most amazing person on the planet, would bring me gifts to the hospital to, to, to play with, you know, like, and, but they were always educational based. They were always like building things or Meccano or cameras. But she brought me a calligraphy set. And she said to me, in a, I remember it very, very sort of innocently, you know, well, don't think about writing as writing. Think about writing as drawing letters. And it was a moment that I just went, oh my God, I can draw these letters. It doesn't have to be about writing. It can be about drawing text. So. That's when I started to really think about <coughs> my own um, sort of literacies and what they were at, at a very young age. And you know, drawing became my, like I said, a crutch. And, um, and like I said, these life things happened. Then when I turned 15, my, my lovely dad there passed away. Um, he was 37 years old. And it was the most, emo most amazing thing that ever happened to me. <laughs> because it made me get out of Wales. It made me move forward in my life, because I would have just stayed there otherwise. But it made me sort of look at myself and try to be somebody that he wasn't able to ever get to. So it was an amazing point of uh, reference for me and my own work. But the funny thing is, they put me on this kind of like uh, crossroads of my life, where I was going to become a priest. I, um, <laughs> I was going to go into the seminary, or I was going to go to fashion school. Quite an interesting combination of things there. Um, uh, and I think it was, well, I don't think, I mean, I probably just wanted to be a nun, actually, because I was obsessed with the clothes. <laughs> but uh, I think, um, I never actually wanted to be a priest, I wanted to be a nun. Um, but uh, as you go through the, the slide, you'll see that the, there's, this has been with me ever since, even though I chose fashion. And then there was this whole sort of, you know, 90s Wales sexuality thing that was in my head that I didn't even know what it meant to be gay or what that word meant. So there was like this amazing kind of amount of stuff that happened all at the same time. And it was hard, really, really hard. And I was bullied constantly for being gay, even though I didn't know what gay meant. Um, but all of those experiences became very important and very powerful moments for me in my life that were rites of passage, and they were hard but there were rites of passage that have made me strong and made me who I am now. And instead of going into the seminary and becoming a priest or a nun, I used that sort of I, those ideas in my work. And in my first collection at uh, Chotland McGloucester College of Higher Education, where I did my, my BFA, was called In Loving Memory. And it was dedicated to my father. And it was all about religious iconography. And, and uh, I was obsessed with um, stigmata and all that kind of lovely stuff. But the, the picture on the end there is when I had to get a job and do something real. I started working in a parachute factory and uh, sewing these amazing parachutes. And it was, again, an amazing moment of recognition of the fact that I had someone's life in my hands sitting at a sewing machine sewing a parachute. And it wasn't just about sewing anymore. It was about actually having someone's life in your hands. Because if there was a simple slip stitch on that parachute, somebody could die. And that was... Um, a major turning point for me. And I think that was where my first point of reference of education came in and wanting to be involved in teaching in some way. Uh, this was my BFA collection. It was all, like I said, about religious iconography. And um, McQueen was, you know, McQueen then, and everybody was copying him. So this is literally Givenchy part two. Uh, 
But this was my, this picture here was my entrance exam to the Royal College. And um, again, talking about crossroads, I was offered a place at the Royal, and uh, I interviewed with Wendy. I was Wendy Dagworthy's first graduating here from, uh, from this school. But I was also offered a place with Louise Wilson at St. Martin's. And to have that thing, to make a decision of like, where do I go? And the thing, that ch the thing that made the decision very easy was my interview with Louise was quite funny. The first thing she said to me when I walked into the room was, oh, fuck, I hate short people. <laughs> first thing she said to me. And I was like, but I've got buffaloes on. I'm not sure. Because <laughs> I had these big, big buffaloes on. And I was just like, I don't want to be around that. You know, I wanted to be here. I wanted to be, and plus my teachers had been to the, my professors in Cheltenham had been to the Royal College. So and my interview here was much more sort of, wholesome and, in, and inviting. So it was a very easy, easy decision to make in the end, but St. Martin's was, in my head, much more famous. So again, it was a crossroads of which way should I go. And just a side note, after I graduated from the Royal College, I actually reapplied to go back to Central St. Martin's to do my MA there, but with my brother's name, because I was like, did I make the right decision? Um, but they found out, and uh, I got into a lot of trouble. Um, <laughs> um, so when I came to the Royal College in 1998, some of my work there, it's the first year work in the two larger pictures and then that was my collection, somebody tapped me on the shoulder and said, do you know that you're dyslexic? And I was like, oh, that's what's wrong. It was an amazing moment where I just suddenly didn't realize, I, I, all these things that I thought were problems actually was, there was a name for it. And it was really, an amazing moment of recognizing that I wasn't stupid. And, and you know, just hearing Eve speak earlier about that kind of like self-deprecating kind of quality that we have. Everybody has something that they think they're not good at, but writing for me was very, very scary and very um, hard. But when someone told me there was a name for it and um, helped me see a way through that, it was really quite amazing. So <coughs> I left the Royal uh, in 2000 and got lots of lovely press. I launched a label. I got a job in Italy. This is my favorite bit of press I ever got. When I went home from uh, Wales, I went home to Wales one weekend and outside every shop in uh, news agents in Wales with these boards with Ponticumber fashion designer, Italian success pick, like woo. <laughs> uh, but it's my favorite piece of press because it's, it's real and it's, it, was, it was home, you know? And um, all within the space of a year, I got loads of press, launched a label, and came back to the Royal College of Art to do my Master of Philosophy in the demise of craft. And, um, but the, the writing thing was still really scary, and uh, I was struggling, and I was trying to do too much, and I was a bit of a club kid, partying a bit too much. So I gave up, and it was the worst thing I ever did with my life. It was very, very hard for me to walk away from something knowing that I shouldn't, but I, I did. And um, <clears throat> then I, um, as you can see here, those of you that know Boys Magazine, you know Boys Magazine in Soho? That's me on the front cover there with my friend Ash, clubbing at Trade. So it was very much, uh, you know, we, I had all these things going on and, and it was very messy actually. And that's why I walked away from the MPhil. And the reason I'm mentioning this so much is because I tried to come back twice to the Royal College. I interviewed twice here to come back um, over the course of the last 10 years and didn't get, didn't get back in. Um, and each time Wendy said to me, she said, you're not ready yet, you're not ready yet. And I, I respect that, you know, and, and I think now it's like years later, you see yourself differently and you know that when you're ready for something that you're able to do it. And I think it was the best thing that could have happened to me is to not get in when I tried to come back. So whilst I was going through this clubbing phase, something amazing happened to me where I got a job at the University of East London teaching uh, as a lecturer full-time. How that happened, I have no idea, um, but it did. And it was the most amazing turning point for me in my life where I wasn't just responsible for me anymore. I was responsible for other people, like making parachutes. And Lucy Jones, who's here actually, was my very first boss. Uh, she was the program director at the University of East London and was a very... Um, supportive in my in my approach to education because it wasn't normal like my approach to design wasn't normal and uh, Lucy launched a program called fashion futures 
which I contributed to, and this was the first exhibition that we had there called Epoch, which was in, where was it? Trinity Boy, Trinity Boy Wharf. And it was an exhibition of ideas. And uh, <coughs> there's six words that have been with me, and idea is one of the words I love to use a lot because I think it's a word that captures so much in a simple place. But what happened then was this sort of weird phase that I went through going, okay, those who can't do teach. I went through this horrible phase of being like, okay, if I'm a teacher, that means I'm not a good designer. I failed as a designer. And I went through this inner dialogue of, you know, f failing at something again. And um, I just suddenly, again, my mum's, she's got these amazing words of wisdom in her that she just pops out with some occasionally. And um, she said, well, just be really good at it. <laughs> just that simple. If, if, if you're worried about it, just be really good at it. And that's when I started to sort of really sort of find my own sort of pedagogy and my own sort of philosophies. And I developed these words called idea, experience, idea, play, focus, edit, conclude. And I started thinking about all of my things that I wasn't very good at, like language and phonetics and uh, semantics and all the things that were word driven. And I started to visualize them and create what I call visual, bloody hell. Um, Algebra, visual algebra, yeah? So, you know, for students, I would find ways of helping them understand ways through the, the difficult sort of la uh, landscape of process and design development. So I would come up with, like, these visual um, algebras to help them understand how to make a cake, how to design a collection, how to build things. So, you know, you'll see. But the idea, play, focus, edit, conclude thing um, has been with me for maybe about nine years now. And... Uh, I then left London and I moved to Savannah, Georgia. Have anyone been there? It's beautiful, but my God, leaving London as a club kid to move to Savannah, Georgia? Whoa, culture shock. Um, so I didn't stay there very long. Um, I then moved on to San Francisco. And then something crazy happened, as the picture at the bottom here is that I outlived my father. And. Um, at 37 years old, this is what he looked like, and that's what I looked like. And then that was a, that was a like, rite of passage right there. Then I had to do, get real, get serious, and um, stop messing about and grow up and not be a club kid. And um, started teaching with the same heart that I had as a student, and the same kind of level of integrity that I had when I was here, which was to work and to be the best that I could be, and just to teach from a very honest place. and. This is some work from one of my students who said to me one day, she had a dream that she made a dress out of a light bulb. And I said, okay, so go and do that then. And she ended up doing this installation of clothes that were made with light. Um, and then I, all these things started to fall into my lap, like it was meant to be. Like I was invited to speak about Future Perfect at the Landor Corporation, which is an international um, collective that talks about you know, the future generally. Um, and then I sort of dealt with the fact that I was a teacher, and I was OK. <laughs> um, and then I just got loads and loads of things started to happen to me, which was really exciting. It's like, because, it's like the universe knew that I was comfortable with who I was now. And um, I started traveling the world, talking about the importance of play in visual communication and fashion. Um, this was in um, a Benali in uh, South Korea. Um, and then. All these amazing things, like I said, just kept coming to me. Like I started working with Louis Vuitton, and uh, we did this thing called reconstruction, where I somehow managed to get Louis Vuitton to give us loads of old samples that were either going to be trashed. So we ended up with these amazing samples that we chopped up and repurposed and rebuilt into reconstruction um, with the students at Parsons. Um, and they, like I said, all these sort of, sort of language issues that I had, I started to use them. So I started to develop things like the periodic table of fashion elements. So the sciences that I'd always run away from, I started to use them in a creative way as opposed to something that was scary. I learned to manage all these things that I was frightened of. Um, and then more stuff started to come my way. As, as uh, Claire said, I was an con education consultant for the, the Met. Uh, for the Savage Beauty and uh, Prada Scaparelli um, exhibition. And just to be even, you know, asked to do those things was just so rewarding. And, and to be um, able to 
talk to like these such massive you know corporation like Met, the Met about what they should do to be able to take this exhibition into a, into an education space. So I did men, I did um, for this uh, the Sav uh, Savage Beauty. I did a workshop with high school students, university students, different workshops, and they all had to bring a bring a brag, uh, bring, bring, uh, ah, bring a bag of trash. So you know he did the Horn of Plenty with the the trash hats, and it was all made out of cans. So that's what we did. We made millinery out of garbage, and it's amazing how because I knew Lee. Um, <coughs> It's amazing how somebody that I'd seen and admired as a student and then knew him later in life, and then you know he passed away, and being able to take his work and take it into a, into a school and get students to make hats out of cans was just an amazing sort of poetic system and, and, and a way to be able to use things that I've had in my life in, uh, in, a, in a different way. Um, <coughs> so then this is some of my, some of my work where you know, I started to produce um, a thing called a 5D sketchbook. Um, where I would uh, make paper dolls and light them and build them and, and sort of try and build systems of seeing clothing from... And it's interesting, uh, somebody was saying about the boundaries between the body and space, and you said uh, about going to the door, you're already at the door. So for me, it was a, the, the 5D sketchbook. I started thinking about where does the garment start and the, and the body end and vice versa. So I started doing all this pattern cutting where I was pattern cutting the body and the garment at the same time, and trying to find the relationship between those interactions between the spaces. Um, this again is another cross section of my life with Lucy. <laughs> You've been around a lot. Um, Lucy was teaching, or she was the dean of a school in uh, uh, Singapore, um, and I was invited over to be an artist in residence over there, where I built um, these dolls and we exhibited them. And then um, Lady Gaga asked me to make one of my dolls for her to wear. And I was like, how the hell am I going to do that? But I did. And I interpreted my dolls into actual. So I basically made these dolls, <clears throat> scanned them into the computer, digitized them up with Electra systems, printed them out, and then cut them in fabric. So it literally became this illustration pattern actual garment. So it went from 2D, 3D, 3D, 2D, 4D, 5D. And then this is the piece that she never gave it back. Um, and then, of course, could I talk about the 5D sketchbook? I took it into a computer system. So um, this was using, um, uh, uh, I can't remember what software it was, but I took the dolls, digitized them, and put them into a sort of a, 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 a animated space. So it's quite poetic that I should end up at FIT, actually, because, you know, the Fashion Institute of Technology, my degree at Cheltenham was called, it was a fashion design and technology degree. Um, and I'm, I'm now um, a chair and a creator of a new program, which very much encompasses and sort of embodies the sort of idea of what fashion and technology means and how they interact with each other. 
And as part of my uh, service to the institution, I started a thing called Graduate Studies Invites. And this was where we invited uh, Research Alive to New York and um, <clears throat> some other uh, Theresa's in there and some other, some other workshops that we've done where we sort of, sort of cross-pollinate knowledge. So it's not rather than just sort of uh, fashion students going to fashion lectures, we have uh, students coming from all different departments to observe and listen to things that might not be discipline, their disciplines and then how they bring that back into fashion. Um, this was something I did called Practice What You Preach, um, which is kind of beginning to tie everything up now. So um, this was at the CFDA recently, and I was, I was really sort of, um, like I said, about the obsession with the idea of not being good at being a designer because now I'm a teacher, you know, the, um, those who can't do teach thing. I think it's the exact opposite, actually. I think those who are good teachers and are meant to be educators are people that are, they have something to offer, and that if they're good people, they do continue to practice what they preach, to then take it back into the classroom, and then how the classroom then informs their, their own practices. Um, so FIT, MFA, um, those words that were with me 10 years ago are now core thesis words for the program. Um, experience is your personal life. Idea is your application. Play is semester one, where they play for an entire semester. Uh, focus is where they focus on the best bits of their play, the accidental innovations, the things that went wrong, the mistakes. Um, then they're going to edit, and then, which is pretty self-explanatory, and then conclude where they conclude the collection. So it's really, this MFA really is basically the story of my life. It's all the things that I've done. It's all the things that went wrong. It's all the things that I messed up on. It's all the things that I am very proud that have happened. You know, even the bad stuff was good stuff. And I think you have to remember that, you know, especially when you're going through dark times. Um, and now we're here doing this, which in itself is a rite of passage. And to be here at the Royal College of Art speaking to this audience, to me, is like a big point in my life where I'm very, very touched to be able to be here and to share. And I'm going to end with some questions and comments, but I think we're going to do that as a panel. So thank you.